Welcome, Grace Covenant, to this time of worship. My name is Richard Kobel. I'm one of the pastors in our community. Well, there is never a dull moment in the life and worship. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, as I was just saying, there is never a dull moment in the life and worship of our congregation. Uh, because of a downed power line and worries about accessibility and power and internet in our building, we are worshiping online only today, but the spirit is moving and I'm just so thankful that we can worship together now online. I want to thank everybody in our congregation and on our staff for making this quick pivot and ensuring that we are able to worship together this morning. So let's all take a good and deep breath in and out and in and out. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
Why are you cast down on my soul? Why am I unsettled? Hope in God, for I shall again praise my help in my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against ungodly people. From those who are disciple and unjust, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you cast me off? Why must I walk about mournfully because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out your light and your truth and let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God. To God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with a heart, <laughs> oh God my God. Why are you so cast down? Oh my soul, and why are you, I unsettled? I... Oh, for I shall again praise my help in God. Let us worship God together. Praise ye the Lord, ye almighty of the creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is my help and salvation. For he brought me now to his temple, draw near, join me. Siblings, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Please join me. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future where we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Help us hear you in the silence. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit through Jesus Christ the light of the world. Amen.
Hear the teaching of Christ. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. Friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and restored to new life. Amen. Friends, this peace that Christ gives us is far too powerful, far too generous and abundant to keep it to ourselves. This is the time to share Christ's peace with everyone we see and meet. We invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another in the chat. Pick up your phone, send some love to some folks. Even though we're not together, our church has no walls. The peace of Christ be with you all. Good CPC kids. So a couple of questions for you all this morning. First question, how many of you all are feeling tired right now? Tell you the truth, I had a bit trouble getting up this morning. I was just feeling just kind of tired and just kind of slow this morning as I was getting up. Maybe you feel that way now. Or maybe you're not tired right now, but, but when you're tired, another question, what do you do? What do you do when you're tired? Hmm, maybe you take a nap or you take a break and you watch some TV. Maybe you go and you fix yourself a snack or drink some water. Maybe you go for a walk and just, you know, have some quiet time. What might you need when you're feeling tired? Well, today, in today's scripture lesson, we're going to learn about a prophet named Elijah. So a prophet is someone who tells people about God and what God wants us to do in our lives. But guess what? This prophet, Elijah, was feeling very, very tired. There were some troubling things happening in this country. And there were some people who even wanted to capture Elijah. It was a scary and a dangerous time for him. It was so hard that, that Elijah was really, he was just about ready to give up, stop being a prophet, stop telling people about God. He went into a wilderness just exhausted. And he sat down under a tree and he, he just felt like giving up. So what do you think Elijah needed at that time? Maybe some of the same things that you need when you're feeling really tired. Well, guess what? An angel visited Elijah. And not only that, the angel brought food and drink. It gave him enough energy for him to just keep going and going. You know, sometimes we need rest when we're exhausted. We need basic things like food and water and just time to ourselves. You know, 
There are times in our lives when we care about something so much that we work ourselves to exhaustion. We just want to keep going and going and going until we can't go anymore. And it's certainly good to have that type of passion for things. But one thing we need to remember is the importance of caring for ourselves too. It's okay to take breaks and to ask for what you need. Elijah's story shows us that God wants everyone, absolutely everyone, to have what they need. And that also means that when we see others in need, we need to share too, because there's always enough to go around. And we all need and we all deserve rest and care. So this Sunday is a very special Sunday. Today, we celebrate the holiday of Juneteenth. That is a holiday where we celebrate the freedom of those in our country who were once held in slavery. We celebrate that freedom and we continue to work towards greater and greater freedom in this country so that all people and all communities can have what they need and what they deserve. So this morning, I want us to remember Elijah. I want us to remember Juneteenth. I want us to remember that God wants everyone, absolutely everyone, to have freedom and to have what they need. Will you pray with me, GCPC kids? Wherever you are, just repeat after me these words. Dear God, we celebrate all you gave to Elijah. We celebrate the freedom of Juneteenth. We pray that you help us work a world where all are free. And all have what they need. Amen. Thanks so much, GCPC kids. Good to be with you this morning. Well, good morning again, Grace Covenant. Welcome to this online service at Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. Grace and peace to you all on this Juneteenth Sunday. As I said at the beginning, my name is Richard Coble. I'm one of the pastors in our community. So if you are tuning in for the first time, or maybe you've been here a few times, but you're still getting to know the Grace Covenant community, we do hope that you'll let us know that you're here. Please say hello in the chat and let us know where you're worshiping from today. It was so good to see that earlier on in the service, seeing people worshiping from near and from far. Another way to connect if you are new to GCPC is emailing us at connect at gcpcusa.org. If you email us a, at, that, um, at that email address, a GCPC staff can, will reach out to you directly and we will say hello. Special thanks to everyone helping us lead worship today. We just saw the YTL Grace for Teens who helped us lead the call to worship this morning. The YTL summer camp started this week in our building and we're just so thankful for YTL's presence in our community. A special thanks to members of our Chancel Choir who recorded videos that we are using in today's worship service. We're also thankful to Denise Lockett, who is serving as our liturgist this morning. Our Deacon of the Week for this week is Jeannie Smith. Her contact info is in the, this week's newsletter. Please remember that you can contact the Deacon of the Week or a member of program staff for any congregational needs or questions. Our flowers this morning are thanks to Jeanette Williams in memory of Al Williams and Jeanette's brother-in-law, Bill Williams and also for a happy birthday to our brother, Ted Ralph. 
So be sure to check out those flowers. You'll be able to see them in Amy Kim's background this morning. So thank you to Jeanette Williams. A couple announcements. Um, the Joy Group is a fellowship group for those in our GCPC community who are retirement age-ish or older. So the Joy Group has taken a bit of a hiatus these past few years for COVID reasons, but we are planning a fun outdoor gathering this coming Saturday at Shindig on the Green in Impact Square. So come out for great music and fellowship starting at 7 p.m. And please make sure to bring a chair and let's have some fun together. We are filled with gratitude for the chance to welcome the Reverend Tammy Forte Logan of Faith for Justice to our virtual pulpit today. This is Sunday is the first of seven times the Reverend Forte Logan will be joining us in the pulpit this summer. And we're just so thankful to her for sharing her wisdom and leadership with us this summer. A few announcements for our youth and children's program. The GCPC Youth and Adults, please let Melvin know by June 23rd, if you are helping at Habitat for Humanity on Saturday, July 6th. That's going to be a day that runs from 8.15 to 3.15 p.m. And we need to fill in, um, we, we need you to fill it, to let us know that you're coming so that we can have the time saved. So please let Melva know by June 23rd if you're gonna be helping with Habitat for Humanity. Next Sunday, June 20, June 26, our rising 6th and 7th graders are invited to Mod Pizza for lunch after the service. Please bring $10 for that lunch. Also, another special announcement. We are thrilled to announce that GCPC's own Colt Bergen has taken the role of interim program assistant for children and youth this summer. Colt started this week, and we are so thankful to have him on staff through September. And then one final announcement for our families and uh, children's ministry. Uh, families, be sure to save the dates of July 24th through 26th. So we have a great family faith time set out those nights for meals, Bible studies, community building, and just so much more. So we're actually going to kick off the event on Sunday, July 24th, following worship. And then the following Monday and Tuesday, we'll be meeting during dinner time. So save those dates, July 24th and 26th, GCPC families. Now would be a great time, if you haven't already done it, to take a photo, send it to prayer at GCPC USA, or post it on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram under the hashtag GCPC at home. We will be sharing those photos during the prelude after worship today. And then finally, just some prayer concerns to have on your hearts and your minds this week. Remember, of course, you can always share prayer concerns with us by putting them in the chat or emailing us at prayer at gcpcusa.org. And we will lift those prayer concerns up during the prayers of the people towards the end of the service. A couple of special prayer concerns to have on your hearts. Longtime friend of Grace Covenant, Winnie Martell, passed away this week in hospice. So our prayers go out to Susie Churchfield and just all of Winnie's community. Winnie Martell's service will be at Inca Baptist Church on Wednesday, June 29th at 6 p.m. That service is at Inca Baptist Church on Wednesday, June 29th at 6 p.m. Also, Grace Covenant member John Stoffer passed away on Friday of this last week at home. Our prayers are with Jane Stoffer and their entire family. We will send out service details at a later date. So our prayers are with both of these beloved families and all who knew and loved Winnie and John. Our hearts and our prayers are with them through this time of transition and grief. Let us now continue with worship. Let us pray. 
Loving God, open us that we may hear you. Silence any voice in us but your own, so that we may clearly hear you and what you are calling us to do. Amen. The scripture is 1 Kings 19, 7 through 15a. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here. Good morning, everyone. Here we are. It's good to be here and giving honor to our God, to uh, your senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Marshall Mount Shue, to the capable uh, Reverend Dr. Richard Coble, to all the wonderful staff here at GCPC, and to all of you God's children. I greet you in the name of Jesus the Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. This morning, uh, the subject for our consideration is returning to the wilderness as we take a closer look at the prophet Elijah. Now, I have already forewarned the staff, and now I'm going to warn you that I am an exegetical preacher. So I hope that you will also be praying with me through the seven uh, sermon journey and that you'll lean into your holy imaginations and your Bibles as we all rely on the spirit of the living God to reveal to us who God is, who God is in us and through us, and how God wants us to be in relationship with each other. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, who is the creator of us all, who loves us all. Now, Lord, we put this into your hands and we trust you to communicate to us that which you would have us to hear. And Lord, help us not to just be hearers of your word, but to be doers also. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, may they be acceptable to you, O Lord, because it is you who is my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 
happy Pride Month to my daughters, Tamika, Kelly, Stephanie, to other family, uh, siblings, and friends here at GCPC in the region, joining us online and beyond. Also, happy Father's Day to all of the fathers, whether biological, extended, surrogates, or fur daddies. And lastly, happy Juneteenth, this June 19th of 2022. So I want to just name that when Marsha and I were scheduling dates, neither of us realized that this Sunday would be both Juneteenth and Father's Day. And it's no coincidence that the fathers of my family, my father, uh, Paul Forte, his father, Gus Forte, his father, Willie Forte, and his father, Matt Fort, who are all now my paternal ancestors, all happen to have their beginnings in the state of Texas, where the story of Juneteenth began. And according to the Texas State Historical Association, the one accredited for bringing this good news to Galveston, Texas on June 19th in 1865, was Union Commander Gordon Granger, who officially declared that the institution of slavery was dead setting off joyful displays by Texas freedmen and women, boys and girls. And so my great, great grandfather, Matt Fort, would have been about 18 at that time. And I could imagine that he and his family and 40 plus other enslaved black folks on the Fort plantation with him would have been celebrating like we are today with food and music and art and dancing and lots of laughing. Now, the Lord knows I love good food. I love good music. I love being in the company of my Black siblings and just lapping up Black joy. But then this prophetic voice rises up in me. And the facts, the truth of a matter begins to flood my brain. And that part, that part of my being, that part that wants to remain in this feeling of all is well, and to see life with rose-colored glasses is quickly just jolted back into reality. And so my brain can't seem to linger in this celebratory matrix for too long. Because the truth is, Juneteenth was not embraced by the white planters and their families and many whites across Texas and the South or even this nation. Slaveholders did not see the humanity of my ancestors. They were just labor, commodities, a means to their wealth. And the huge profits they were making from extracting their labor was now threatened. 49% of taxable property at that time was black bodied people. And so many of the plantation owners retaliated. They threatened, they terrorized and killed formerly enslaved black folks who were trying to leave the plantation toward their freedom. In Bowie County, where my ancestors live, representatives of the Freedmen's Bureau, a government entity set up to help formerly enslaved folks transition into freedom, was frequently attacked. And a disgruntled and notorious white man by the name of Cullen Baker went on a killing spree against black body folks and white folks who tried to help them. So it is hard for me to linger in the state of celebration around Juneteenth or July 4th or any celebration related to America for very long. But there are times that I do linger, that you linger, we all linger. And if we're not careful, we can become stuck in this state of mind rooted in an illusion of exceptionalism or of white supremacy. 
because it's what we know. It is what we have been raised in. It's what we have been trained in, what we have practiced the most. Theologian Walter Brueggemann calls it a royal consciousness, a consciousness that is beholden to the royals, the king and queen, the president, to a political party, to denomination, to hierarchy, to systems rooted in white supremacy, sustained by capitalism, and justified by religion. When instead our consciousness should be rooted in our relationship with God and with one another. So siblings, we have built this muscle, a lot of muscle, strengthening the narrative of our exceptionalism as a nation and our superiority as a people. Progressive movements, leaders, organizations, and churches have mastered this language of diversity and equity and inclusion without ever naming race or grappling with the intersections of all oppressions. And the stark reality is that black bodies are disproportionately and adversely impacted by every single system, every single oppressed group in this country. But the prophet part of me is always in tension with this reality because I don't want it to be true. I don't want to always to be able to predict the racial inequity that's at play and then be proven right. But it's what God often puts in my mind and my heart and my soul. And sooner or later, it's going to come out of my mouth. And so surprisingly, I am not always welcome in all spaces. Surprise. There is this atmosphere of suspicion that often seems to surface the moment I walk in certain rooms. And perhaps I am seen as a troublemaker. I don't know. But most prophetic, prophetic voices are, including Elijah. Elijah was referred to by Ahab as the troubler of Israel, Ahab being the king of Israel. So he was considered a troublemaker to those in power, those who were stuck in their idolatry. And they hated to see Elijah coming. And when he did, they just knew there's not gonna be any good news today. Like Elijah, there are moments I have felt like the troubler of Asheville, of progressive and other churches and other spaces. Not that I create trouble for anyone, but because there are times that I am compelled, I can't help myself to speak truth in places where bail, where royal consciousness, where white supremacy and its preservation is the reigning God, but not Yahweh, not Jehovah. And those spaces where folks say they are committed to liberty and justice for all, where we spout collective liberation and equity, but the moment that no one is looking, we do as we've always done. My grandchildren, Amina, who's four, and Amari, who's five, have picked up this bad habit of saying, I'm sorry, the minute they realize they're caught doing something that they're not supposed to do, without even thinking about it. They seem to just instinctively know that they should not do or say a thing And almost as a reflex, here it comes. I'm sorry. But the truth is, they're really not sorry. They may be sorry they got caught. But they really have no intention of changing their behavior. Because the moment they think you are out of sight, they're right back at it again. Somehow, they have internalized this message that as long as I say I'm sorry, they can still do what they want to do without consequences. Now, adults who are committed to this royal consciousness, to this illusion of white supremacy do the same thing. With no intention of ever really changing or adjusting and forget transformation, but they will work overtime saying the right thing, reading the right books, presenting the optics of equity, of fairness, 
of righteousness, but the truth is when they think no one is looking, when equity is no longer a requirement, when demographics of board compositions is no longer a thing, they go back to business as usual. Now, Jezebel and Ahab in this story are different. They are the king and Phoenician queen of Israel. They didn't care about optics, how they appeared, who saw them, who heard them. They wanted what they wanted when they wanted it, how they wanted it. And if you confronted them with the truth, they would figure out how to get rid of you as soon as possible. Now, I know that Elijah is in a pickle, right? And I, I don't know why he went beyond calling down fire from heaven, if you read the earlier chapter, to consume the altar and the water around it. I don't know why he additionally ordered the death of 850 prophets whose allegiance was to Jezebel. Now, perhaps it was his interpretation of Levitical law, which was pretty violent. But because of his violence, whether one could make an argument on whether it was justified or not, it has consequences. So the scripture passage in 1 Kings 19 begins with Jezebel putting a hit out on Elijah when she finds out. And she creates this contract, if you will, to have him killed. And she told him she was going to kill him. She didn't hide it. She didn't plan it in a backdoor meeting. She sent the message directly to Elijah. Now, Jezebel was enraged that Elijah had her prophets killed her prophets whose voices nurtured her cognitive dissonance whose voices told her what she wanted to hear whose voices placated her anger stroked her ego justified her greed and narcissism and overconsumption those were the voices she wanted to hear she did not want to hear elijah's voice she didn't want to hear the truth. She didn't want to hear that her behavior was wicked, that her treatment of the poor was ungodly, that the history of her people was not the full story. So Elijah's prophetic voice, coupled with the silencing of the false narrative she wanted to hear, sent her into a murderous rage against Elijah. Now, Elijah is this confident, powerful spiritual prophet who could tap into the supernatural power from God with a gesture of his mantle, could call down fire from heaven, is the only prophet other than Moses that shows up in the company of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, has firsthand experience with being provided for by God in the middle of a famine and brought a dead child back to life. And yet, in this moment, in this point of Elijah's journey, Elijah is extremely vulnerable. He is feeling his humanity. He is feeling emotions of pain and grief and depression. Yes, depression as a man of God. And he's found himself both literally and figuratively in the wilderness in a desert place, in a dry place on his journey with God, where he's feeling afraid, where he just can't take it anymore. Now, at first he runs in fear from death, but by the time he spends a day in the wilderness, he is ready to just die. All it took was one day to wear him down, to bring him down to this state. Have you ever been there? Where there are days when you just feel like you are at the top of the world and things are in your life are going well and even conflicts and challenges come and you can pivot and move on and feel confident that everything will be all right. But then one day, just one day, a series of events can change all of it. 
And even though you know that you belong to God, you're a child of God, you know that God loves you. You know that God has taken care of you, has provided for you, has empowered you to do amazing things that has surprised even you. And you may have had an amazing life, most of your life, and yet you find yourself in this slump, depressed, with suicidal thoughts, and you hear yourself like Elijah is saying, Lord, I cannot take it anymore. I can't do this anymore. I want out. And so in this scripture passage, after all that Elijah has endured, after all he has overcome, after following the call of God and the will of God, doing exactly what God has called him to do now, we find Elijah running for his life in the wilderness and asking God to take his life. But the good news is that we do serve a God who specializes, who knows exactly what we're going through from day to day and moment to moment and knows exactly what we need. And what Elijah needs more than anything else is rest. Yes, rest. Elijah is tired. Elijah really is exhausted. He has been ministering in the midst of a famine, bringing dead children back to life, prophesying to powerful people, which is always draining because they never want to listen. And he's literally running to get where he is. So he is exhausted. Because we live in a capitalistic society, we are always driven to do more, to produce at all costs, even if it costs our own health. And we will tell ourselves that the good we are doing is so needed that if we don't do it, it won't get done. But you just die and the people you left behind will pivot and life will continue without you. I guarantee you it will. But the other side of this is that oppressed people of culture are always trying to prove their worth. So they're working, we're working overtime, thinking we're not good enough, that we need to be better. And it can be crazy making, but more important is detrimental to our physical health and our spiritual health. Years ago, when I served as an executive director for Neighbors and Ministry, Rise and Shine Freedom School was our key program. And I worked 70 plus hours a week. I was the first one there. I was the last one to leave. And I had so much on my mind in a given day. I could not sleep at night unless I had a pad next to my bed so that I could offshore what was in my mind onto paper and go to sleep. And then the headaches began and the stomach aches and the back aches came. And worst of all, I supervised some 14 college interns and they were working with our children during the summer and watching me. And one day I finally realized that they were watching me and that I was setting a bad example for them that they needed to pace themselves. They needed to breathe and rest. They need to eat on time. And I needed to stop so that they would start taking care of themselves, that they would begin their journey, begin their careers, taking care of their bodies, their minds, and their souls. And then later, when I resigned, 14 years later, it was hard for neighbors and ministry to adjust. And the new leadership did things differently, but the program kept going without me. And we'll celebrate 20 years this fall. So don't ever fool yourselves into thinking that we are the only ones that can do anything because God's <laughs> anything that God does, that God ordains, God will also sustain. And I'm going to say that again, anything that God ordains, God will also sustain. God does not need you. 
And so because God knew Elijah needed rest, when Elijah finally stopped running, God made sure Elijah landed under the shelter of a broom tree in the middle of the wilderness. And this broom tree was covered with white, fragrant, honey smelling flowers that had this relaxing aromatherapy impact. And it allowed Elijah to rest and relax enough to really go to sleep and rest his mind and rest his body. And Elijah is, is so exhausted that he has to be awakened by a messenger of God to eat a couple of times. And when he finally eats enough to strengthen his body for this 40 day, 40 night journey ahead of him, the first place he has is to the mountains of Horeb, Mount Horeb. Not on the mountain top, but he hides in a cave. And God questions him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, some of us are out of place. And we're hiding in caves in our own lives. We're dumbing down, staying below the radar as much as we can. But if we are not standing squarely in the will of God, we're in the wrong place. And like Elijah, we are quick to make excuses to justify why we don't do more or to tell God all that we are doing for him as if God doesn't know. Hmm. It's still an excuse. And it's an excuse that will not move us any closer to God or to our own liberation. And all of us have these moments. All of us have these moments when we just don't think we're good enough. And when I am in that state of mind, my go-to is Mary Williamson's poem, Our Deepest Fears. So I'm going to read that for you. And I hope it just sinks into you deeply that you will internalize it. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in every one of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. But we can't see or be that light without being truthful to ourselves first. So Elijah's excuse and untruth makes no sense and definitely does not get Elijah closest to God. And he fabricates this. He says, Lord, I am zealous for you if it's as if no one else is, but they, the Israelites, have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your places of worship and killed all your prophets except me. And now they're trying to kill me too. First of all, that's not what God asked him. God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And this is Elijah's response. And it's not a true response because Elijah is not the only prophet left. Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace, hid a hundred of them from Jezebel to make sure that didn't happen. And even if all of them were killed, God has the power to raise up whoever God needs to be God's voice. But when you're exhausted, your mind will tell you anything. Now, my former pastor, Patricia A. Gaynor, Reverend Dr. Patricia A. Gaynor, used to always say, if you tell God the truth, God can help you. What are you doing here, Elijah? All he had to do was tell him the truth, but he couldn't do that. What are you doing here, Elijah? I'm going to make it personal. What are you doing here, Tammy? What are you doing here, GCPC? 
We have to get out of the caves, the silos, our comfort zones, our functions in church that keep us disconnected from one another. Because in that cave, Elijah can't hear or see God. What he heard was this wild wind, the raging earthquake and fire, but it was not until he became or came out of the cave that he was able to hear in the stillness, in the quiet and be still and listen to God in the silence. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, you can't stay in the cave. You can't stay in your fear. You can't stay in your excuses. You have to get out. And I'm going to send you right back to the wilderness, right back to the place you're running from, right back to the difficulties that you're facing, right back to the things you thought you were going to be able to leave behind. I am returning you to the wilderness. That's not what we want to hear. But in fact, God has prepared us to do exactly that. And when God sends us into the wilderness, it's not because God does not love us. In fact, it's because God loves us so much. And God knows that as you go through that journey, as you go through that desert place, that dry place, that God will minister to you there, that you will be able to hear God, that it won't be clouded by all of your stuff, your ego and your desires and your ambition, but you'll be able to tune into our God. It is so interesting to me when I think about my own story, that that same place that I worked years ago and I resigned from is my first kind of immersion into white Christian culture because we worked with over six different predominantly mainstream denominations, predominantly white denominations um, in ministering to our children there. And so when I left that space, I thought I was leaving that behind me because I became really immersed in Latinx community and black community. But God sent me right back to the wilderness, right back into relationship with my white siblings, many of you who are watching me right now, because it is in that rough place, those dry places that I have learned where my healing is, where I have learned more about myself and more about who God is and the power of God and the ability of the Holy Spirit to transform us all when we are willing to tell the truth. And so God does return us to the wilderness, but in the wilderness, there is hope. In the wilderness, there is healing. In the wilderness, there is transformation. So I pray GCPC that you would trust God and know, know that we must get out of the cave and return to the wilderness. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, amen. Oh, I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. Oh, I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. Did ever you see the like before? I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. King Jesus preaching to the poor. I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. Oh, I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. Oh, I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. Oh, wasn't that a happy day? I know the Lord laid his hands on me. 
When Jesus washed my sins away, I know the Lord laid his hands on me. Oh, I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. Oh, I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord laid his hands on me. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the beauty and sustenance so freely given in nature. We stand amazed at the meticulous care with which you have shaped the universe and all living things, each of us a child of God. We ask that you guide us as we seek to walk in balance on your earth. God, in your grace, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift to you our nation. When we say that, there's just so many things that come up in our bodies from the ways that we are at war within ourselves, with one another in our nation that doesn't have to do with weapons and yet there are weapons everywhere that are being used. Lord, we recognize our place in this system and deeply desire to break down these systems of oppression. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to get out of the cave and to step into the wilderness for that clarity, for that transformation, for courage and the ability to recognize the place in which we stand is holy ground and that you have placed us in the midst of this nation to move and to be so that everyone can move and be. We are also mindful of our General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church that is meeting, where people are gathering from east, west, north, and south to discern your will as a denomination. We lift up the leaders, we lift up our newly elected moderators, and our stated clerk. Lord, may we all be conduits of transformation and healing and hope in your nation. God, in your grace, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray for Asheville. Give wisdom to our community leaders. We pray that we would be able to surprise you that you would provide us with support and stamina for our ministry partners. Be with all those in our community who continue to be impacted by the pandemic, the ongoing plight of gun violence, homelessness, and food insecurity. Help us to care for the most vulnerable. We pray for Grace Covenant, guide our committees and our councils and our staff. We pray for Marsha Mount Shoup during her sabbatical time. We pray for strength in our never ending work for justice and inclusion that all might know your love. Be with those among us who are hurting, for those who are mourning, for those experiencing loss, or feeling especially far from you on this day. May we do all we can to meet people where they are and to reach out with open arms. May we lead and love boldly. God in your grace, hear our prayer. God of grace, we lift up to you now all of the prayers that are on our hearts. We pray aloud those who are on our prayer list, we pray for the Iglesia Jerusalem congregation, for Maria and Esteban, we pray for Seth Turnbow, Vince and Michelle, Chris Lambert, Shabnan and Sana, we pray for Deanna Fleener, 
We pray for Estilta Ruiz and Sierra Williams. We lift up Trey and Alicia Thompson and their kids, Gabby, Arlo, Eldon. We play, pray for Jorge Lopez, Gail Buchanan and family. We lift up Paula Kelton. God, we lift up Bob Higgins, Susan Smilowitz, Doris Prack. We pray for Michelle Cromie and the Cromie family. We pray for Bob Schaefer, Hans and Lily and their newly arrived baby Amara. We pray for Francis Johnson, Don and Gloria Moe, Janet Hovis. Pray for Stacy and Kelly Haddenham. We lift up Earl Fowler. We pray for the Kremas Parks family. We pray for the family of John Stoff and prayers for the family and the community of Winnie Martell. And we lift up Karen Rolls. God, again, we lift up Susie and all those who uh, mourn Winnie. We pray for uh, Marsha Mount Shoup as she is on sabbatical. We lift up Nancy and Dolores. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for Hanan, who is who is with a serious leukemia re recurrence now. We pray, pray thanks be to God for the gift of Tammy Forte Logan. We pray for the staff of YTL and Grace Covenant. We lift up St. Stephen's Church in Birmingham. Prayers for Libby that she can let go and rest. For Jay and her family as they grieve. We pray for community and especially communities experiencing violence. We pray for those who are incarcerated and for all who suffer under systems of oppression. We pray for those who have lost members of their family to gun violence. God, there are so many prayers on our hearts, whether they be said aloud or just spoken silently. God, we know and we trust you that you're present in all of them. And so in that love and in that trust, we pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Grace Covenant, all that we have comes from God. It is a response and an act of thanksgiving to give back. There are many ways to give this morning. You can scan that barcode on your screen. You can text give GCPC. You can go to our website and click under giving, or you can just mail uh, text directly to our office. Let us now receive and give thanks for this morning's offering. Praise God from whom the blessings flow. Praise Christ all people here below. Praise Holy Spirit ever. Triune God, whom we adore. 
Let us pray. Lord, we present these gifts as an offering of our lives. May you bless these gifts and help us to be good stewards of all that you have given us and recognize how blessed we are. Amen. GCPC and all who are and will listen, I pray that you're all willing to see yourself in Elijah, that you will rest, that you will feel, that you will find healing and transformation in the very places God is sending you, but that you're running from, that you will return to the wilderness. 
Now may the love of our Is that you, Micah? Hey, Tammy, I can hear you. Oh, that's Richard. Okay. Do you want to just finish it off then um, with the benediction? Can you put Tammy up? Um, I need to say it again is what you're saying? Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. Okay, GCPC and all who are and will listen, I pray that you're willing to see yourself in Elijah, that you're rest, that you'll feel, that you'll find healing and transformation in the very places God is sending you, but that you're running from, that you will return to the wilderness. Now, may the love of Almighty God the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. GCPC, it's good to be here with you. Blessings on your week. We'll see you next Sunday.